Greetings, friends. Good to see you again. Time for coffee. This is Pastor Pete at Abundant Life Church in uh, Lakewood, Washington. Today's Thursday, the 12th of November, 2020. Um, hope life is going along well enough for you. It's time to get our coffee, get our Bibles open. We're going to have a little conversation. Today we're going to continue our conversation I started last week talking about hope. So grab some coffee, get your Bible, get it open to... Um, Daniel in the Old Testament, the third chapter. Well, you can start in the first chapter, but the third is where we're going to find the scriptures for discussion. So here's to you. So today we're going to continue, as I said, a conversation about hope. And I'm going to use a story from Daniel. It's going to be the story of uh, Daniel and his three friends. And uh, you, you recognize the elements of it, the fiery furnace. But I'm going to pull out of it a couple of really important uh important questions actually that get asked and a couple of important statements that get made and and from that I want to give you a really clear understanding of the nature of hope and what I want to tell you is this this is the this is the end of the story and it's also the beginning of the story hope is an all or nothing equation hope requires our complete trust if you say I have hope in a certain person or I have hope in a certain event or I have hope in God. If you say I have hope in God, there's no room to say, and I'm also going to make sure that I do this other thing just in case God doesn't work out. There, there, you know, Jesus told us he's the way. He's the only way. No one can come to the Father except by him. There's only one way, and, and it requires an all-in. Uh, recently, I was in a discussion with a friend about uh, investments and, and retirement investments and where to save money and what happens with the political environment that we're in. And and, uh, and so, you know, we have mutual funds, right? And a mutual fund is you own a bunch of different stocks or bonds or, or whatever. And, and if one goes up, the other one goes down, and they kind of keep themselves in balance. And you hope that overall, you get a little bit better, a little bit better. But God's economy doesn't work that way. His economy for salvation doesn't work that way. Hope is an all-or-nothing thing. And Daniel and his friends really demonstrate this to us very well. So I'm going to use them as the illustration. And hopefully you'll, you'll see, again, these two big questions and a couple big statements. The, briefly the story. Daniel and his three friends, you know them, you know their names. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You know those three guys. Well, you probably know them better by the names that they were giving, given when they got taken captive and got taken to Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's funny because Daniel still gets known by his previous name and not by his new name of Belteljazar. But anyway, we know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In a, in a nutshell, and it's really fascinating reading. It's a great storyline if you just read it from the first chapter. But here's these bright young men, super talented, phenomenal characters. They have an amazing, bright future. They were taken captive. When there was a war in Israel and the Babylonians, the Persians, captured them, they took away the best young men from the nation of Israel, along with lots of other things from the temple and from the, uh, from the, the, the sanctuary. And it, they took away all the best, which is what, what happened when one nation conquered another. They took the best. They took them captive, and they brought them back to Babylon. And that's where they were... Uh, they were then working. They were all working on behalf of the of the uh, king, working on behalf of Nebuchadnezzar in this case. And so what happens is they they they, they show themselves faithful. Daniel and had already interpreted some dreams, had already uh, had the the vegetarian diet that worked for them, and so they were already finding favor and they were being promoted. And when Daniel got promoted because of his dream interpretation, he said, "Bring my three friends along." They will help run this kingdom better than ever before. And so Nebuchadnezzar promoted them. They were in high, important positions. Not the very highest, but pretty high. And then we get to chapter 3. And Nebuchadnezzar, who's really full of himself, who's actually previously been referred to as the king of kings, like those who come to give him advice, those who come to bow down, those who come to worship him, have already called him the king of kings. And on this earth, at that time, Babylon was in charge of all peoples. It refers to that all the time, that people, all people from across the whole known world were worshiping him. And so Nebuchadnezzar decides, I'm going to erect a statue. It's like 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. It's a statue of himself. And, and you know the story. He says, everybody, when you hear the, the music play, 
when you hear the horns sound and the tr- and the drums play and the strings, when you hear all of that, everybody should bow down and worship the statue. And if you don't, if you don't worship the statue, you will immediately be tossed into the fiery furnace. There's no second chance. There's no explaining your way out of it. Immediately tossed into the fiery furnace. That's the decree that he has laid down. And he's done it in a way that uh, he even he cannot go against his own word because of the way that they had laws written in those days. And so his advisors had said, do this. Well, his advisors, some of them, the, the Chaldeans, who actually were uh, jealous competitors of Daniel and his guys, because the Chaldeans formerly had been the out-of-town experts, the, the former experts who could advise the king, they were unable to interpret the dreams. And actually, their lives were in danger. And Daniel said, no, spare everybody's lives. I'll interpret the dreams. <clears throat> so they carry some jealousy, though, because these new guys, these exiles, as they were called, they were taken captive, and they were referred to multiple times in the book of Daniel as the exiles. Like, they're not from around here. They don't belong here. We are the ones who are really... Keeping this place going, King. Don't forget us. We're the Chaldeans. What are these exiles got that we don't got? So they set apart doing a plot to catch them. And so they observed that uh, when the horn sounds, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't bow down and worship. So they go running off to Nebuchadnezzar and says, didn't you pass a law? Well, we know some people who are not doing it. The thing is, they weren't just tattletaling. It's really interesting. This is a really important statement that they made. They weren't just tattletelling. The Chaldeans were truth-telling. They were telling the very truth. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not bowing down. They were not worshiping. So the tattletelling wasn't making up a story. It was telling the very true thing about them. I'm going to pick up the story and let the scriptures tell us a little bit about it. Daniel chapter 3 Starting at verse 13, this is what it says that happens next. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. And so they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, here's the first big question that he asked. Listen to this question. Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Go back to the story in a moment. But is it true? If we were found in a situation where we had to choose between God, where all of our hope needs to lie, and our employer, or our school, or our community, or our government, if we were found that we had to make a choice to follow one or follow the other, and someone told the truth that we were going to follow our God, and then we were confronted to testify about our own selves, would there be evidence that would show that we had followed God? And then what would our answer be? Is it true that you don't worship what we put forward? Powerful question. Let's carry on in verse 15. He says, Nebuchadnezzar says, Now if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. So he's like giving them a second chance, even though... His law says he shouldn't. He goes on and he says, But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Now get ready, because here comes the second question that Nebuchadnezzar asked. The first one was, Is it true that you're not going to worship me? The second one is, says, And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? He asks the question, Who is this God that has so much of your attention and your trust and your hope You believe that they can deliver you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar. Now remember, these were loyal, faithful, hardworking. They had risen because of their character and their capability and their talents, their dedication. They were in on the success of the kingdom. But they answered him and they said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Complete hope. He's able. We don't have any question about it. If that's what you're going to do, that's what you're going to do. But we know our God is able. We have all of our hope in Him. And they go on to say, And He will deliver us out of your hand, O King. 
But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They're saying in this final verse, but if not, we know God's capable and we believe he will. We have our hope in him. But if he chooses by his sovereign will not to do that, we're not going to hedge it. We're not going to half step it. We're not having a mutual fund approach to our future. We're all in with God. Our God is able and we're all in. So you know how the story goes from there, right? Um, they get tossed in the fire. <laughs> I mean, they bring some of the bravest soldiers from the kingdom, uh, and they and they they take them right up and throw them in the fires, like made seven times hotter than ever. And the soldiers themselves are destroyed in the process of delivering Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire furnace. But immediately, the fourth person appears. And the king sees it, and he's asking everybody what's going on. I'm really cutting through the whole story quickly, but you know the story. They come out of the furnace, and there's not a single ill effect on them. They don't. They don't. They haven't been burned. Their clothes haven't been destroyed. They don't even smell like smoke coming out of there. And Nebuchadnezzar is just amazed. Who else was in there with you? You got saved. He's basically witnessed what they said was true. Who is this God? Well, listen to what happens <clears throat> when, uh, when in, starting in verse 28 of chapter 3 and continuing into chapter 4. Listen to what happens. Listen to what Nebuchadnezzar then says following the salvation of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by God. Listen to this. Nebuchadnezzar answers and says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. He's, he's basically describing their all-in hope, 100%. He's describing it. And he says, bless that god. Bless that god. Therefore, says Nebuchadnezzar, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. He promoted him even higher. He gave him even more responsibility because he knew they walked with God and with that confidence and that hope in God. But it doesn't stop there. You see, because like, like the, what's the result of them being tossed in, them being saved? They were saved. Their faith, you might say, saved them. They're, I would say their all-in hope in God not only saved them, but for a much higher purpose, it changed the king's heart. And the king became the leader of a revival in his own nation. Listen to chat, the first three verses of chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar, writing to all the people's nations and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you, he writes. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and the wonders that the Most High God has done for me. Do you hear what he's saying? Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I'm writing a decree, I'm writing out a message to everybody because it's good to me that I should tell you about how good God has been to me. So he's gone from being, I am God and I need to be worshipped, the king above all kings, to acknowledging that there is one higher, one greater, one who is able and willing to deliver us. And this is what he says to all those people. He says, how great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Friends, hope is powerful. Because of the one we hope in. But I want to tell you again and encourage you just where I started. Hope is an all or nothing. If you say, I put my hope in God, then put your hope in God. And don't rest your hope on what this world can deliver or promise or which side of the argument or the discussion you might be on. Put your hope in God. I pray this day that you will recognize and understand how much God loves you and how much he desires to have eternal relationship with you and that you will put your complete trust and faith and belief and hope in a God who saves. In Jesus' name, amen.